Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be my neighbor? These are the words of, these are the words Mr. Rogers sang to us at the start of every episode of his children's show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. We're gonna come back to Mr. Rogers' invitation. I'd like to tell you about my first mistake as a chaplain. In this story, I change identifying details to maintain confidentiality, but I keep the essence of what happened. Josie came to the hospital with advanced cancer and was brought to the ICU where she promptly dismissed her nurse and her doctor. I heard that Josie had spent much of her life living without a stable home. I did not want to go in, but knew that I had to. With a shaky voice, I introduced myself and spiritual care and Josie just glared at me. What do you think you can do for me? I took a breath and still shaky said, I don't know, that's what I wanted to ask you. Josie continued to stare at me. I still, after many years, I still think that the only reason I didn't get thrown out was because Josie could tell that I was scared and she took pity on me. No one wants to talk to me, Josie finally said. I'm a nobody. Have you ever felt like a somebody, I asked. Yes, she told me. I was a somebody when I had cats. I took such good care of them and they loved me. I continued to visit Josie throughout the week and heard from the team that she wasn't sleeping and it was affecting her overall health. I asked Josie why she couldn't sleep. She told me about how the machines and the white walls brought back terrible memories. I knew, knew that she needed cat wallpaper. And somehow I convinced the unit social worker, Marguerite, to also see that this was necessary. Marguerite had been an ICU social worker for 20 years and let me know that this was her first attempt at hospital wallpaper. After hours, Marguerite helped me hang about 100 cats around the room. Josie said we were ridiculous and we're gonna get fired. Josie also slept that night. Marguerite and I continued to visit with Josie. Eventually, Josie's team determined that there was no treatment that could help her cancer and the team transitioned her care to hospice. Josie accepted this, but was very upset that she could not die at the hospital. You're going to a really nice and peaceful place, Josie's nurse told her. It's so much calmer than the hospital. I don't wanna go. Why can't I stay here? I promise I won't take up much space. I just wanna be here. The state of our healthcare system is a whole other sermon. Marguerite and I knew that we couldn't change Josie's care plan and we knew that she was very sad and very scared to leave. We waited for the ambulance to arrive to transfer her and we walked her stretcher to the elevator. Josie motioned to me first. She gave me a hug and said, I love you. 
My mind raced with the boundary warnings that I had been taught. I looked at Josie's pleading eyes and said, thank you, we will all miss you. I knew the minute I said it that I had made a huge mistake. Luckily, Marguerite was there and embraced Josie. I love you, Josie said to Marguerite. Without hesitation, Marguerite said, I love you too, sweetheart. I will be calling to check on you each day. You are very special to us. Just as I had known that I said the wrong thing, I knew that our social worker had said the right thing. I believed that if I told a patient I loved her, I would be breaking a boundary. I believed that love was reserved only for the deepest of my relationships, those I have a long history with and claim as my friends or my family. Healthy boundaries give us space. They do not harden our hearts. The rigidity of what I thought was right felt so wrong. Don't get involved, don't get attached. It's not your responsibility. Do these phrases sound familiar? When you feel safe enough, whole enough, okay enough, do these phrases feel right as a starting point for engaging with the people around you? They don't for me, and they don't feel right for Unitarian Universalism. Our first principle calls us to see each person as having inherent worth and dignity. And our second principle calls us to evoke justice, equity, and compassion in all of our human relationships. Take a breath with me. Think of a stranger. What do you picture? What feelings emerge? Think of a neighbor. What do you picture? What feelings emerge? Our faith calls us to see others not as strangers, but as neighbors. And there is no greater teacher on what it means to be a neighbor than Reverend Fred Rogers, known to the world as simply Mr. Rogers. A neighbor is defined as a person living near or a fellow being. When identified as a star, Mr. Rogers said, I have never really considered myself a TV star. I always thought I was a neighbor who just came for a visit. When talking about his philosophy on life, Mr. Rogers explained, we're all on a journey, each one of us, and if we can be sensitive to the person who happens to be our neighbor, that to me is the greatest challenge as well as the greatest pleasure. So if we see those around us as our neighbors, how do we treat them? Mr. Rogers teaches us that we must love our neighbors. Love is a small word with a depth of meaning. Love is defined as an intense feeling of deep affection. But what does love mean to you? We might picture someone we know well, but what about someone that we don't know well? Have you been loved by a neighbor? Have you loved a neighbor? Mr. Rogers offers some guidance for what loving our neighbor can mean. Mr. Rogers teaches us to notice each other. Mr. Rogers teaches us to accept each other. Mr. Rogers teaches us to appreciate each other. Mr. Rogers teaches us to listen to each other. And Mr. Rogers teaches us to help each other. Notice, accept, appreciate, listen, help. While giving a commencement speech, Mr. Rogers tells this story. A few years ago, I was asked to be a part of a White House meeting about children and television. I was seated beside Mrs. Clinton, who afterwards said congratulations, and was whisked away. As I was leaving that enormous room, I heard something from one of the military guards who was all dressed up in white and gold. I heard him whisper, thanks, Mr. Rogers. So I went over to him, noticed that his eyes were moist, and I asked him, thanks for what? 
Well, sir, he said, as I listened to you today, I started to remember my grandfather's brother. I haven't thought about him in years. I was only seven when he died, but just before that, he gave me his favorite fishing rod. I've been thinking maybe that's why I like fishing so much and why I like to show the kids in my neighborhood all about it. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the major reason for my going to Washington that day was that military guard and nourishing the memory of his great uncle. What marvelous mysteries we're privileged to be a part of. Why would that young man be assigned to guard that particular room on that particular day? It's slender threads like that that weave this com complex fabric of our life together. Mr. Rogers, off camera, saw this guard as a neighbor. He noticed him, he accepted him, he appreciated him, he listened to him, he loved him. While in Mr. Rogers' hometown just a few weeks ago, I had a short break during a busy day and I went into a local coffee shop to get a cup of tea. There were a few people in front of me and the line was not moving. The two people in front of me huffed loudly. Oh, come on, the person in front of me said before storming out and another customer quickly followed. After their departure, I could see what was happening. The barista, I'll call him Jay, was tattooed on every inch of his skin and his face was full of piercings. He was leaning over to show a group of young people something. As I walked closer, I could hear teenagers with strong accents apologizing repeatedly. Jay smiled, said it's okay, then used his phone to open Google Translate. The kids pulled out cash and the barista looked at me, smiled and said, sorry, I will be with you soon. He took their cash, gave them their change, then pulled a handful of coins. See, he said, and went through each coin, explained how many cents it made, and then wrote them out on a little chart. The students, who had looked so scared, smiled. Jay made their drinks, then put together a plate of snacks. Welcome to Pittsburgh, he said. You can always come here, and if I'm working, I will help you. He then put this into the phone. The students left and Jay apologized to me again. I really appreciate your patience, he said. I really appreciated his kindness. I teach kindergartners and I like helping people, he said. They just arrived, they seem lost and in need of help. Jay noticed them, accepted them, appreciated them, listened to them and helped them. The love that this barista showed these exchange students was palpable, and I trust that it was felt beyond the barriers of language. Just one more story. I got out of work late a few weeks ago, and the tea was very crowded, despite the late hour. I sat near a woman who also looked like she had worked a long shift. She was on the phone speaking in a language I didn't recognize. As she got off the phone, I closed my eyes. Then I heard her start to cry. I stole a look at her and saw her hands shaking as she wiped tears away. I felt our society's messaging harden my heart. Don't get involved. I felt my insecurities harden my heart. She will think you are weird if you start engaging. I thought of Mr. Rogers. I softened my heart. I got out paper and drew a rainstorm and a hand extending an umbrella over another. I drew a heart. As we reached my stop, I tapped the woman, placed my hand over my heart, and handed her the picture. She looked at the picture, smiled, tapped her hand over her heart. I noticed someone crying. I accepted their sadness. I appreciated what they must be carrying. I tried to help. And in doing these things, she went from being a stranger to being a neighbor. I extended love beyond my comfort zone and it surprisingly felt comfortable. Won't you be my neighbor? Will you challenge our society's urging to turn inward? Will you have the courage to love outside of your inner circle? Mr. Rogers' lessons on love give us options for many different emotional capacities. 
If you are feeling strong with a full well, you can help a neighbor. If you are feeling weary, you can notice a neighbor. And in between noticing and helping, you can accept, appreciate, or listen. Any or all of these acts is an act of love. Any or all of these acts turns a stranger into a neighbor. And we so desperately, desperately need neighbors. Mr. Rogers taught this to his young viewers. As you grow, I trust you are finding many more ways to show and tell people you love them. Those are the most important things you'll learn to do. Because loving people and animals and the world we all live in is the most important part of being alive. My friends, may love expand outside of your inner circle. Here, may you notice and be noticed. May you accept and be accepted. May you appreciate and be appreciated. May you listen and be listened to. May the out there become a neighborhood. Amen. And now for our benediction, I invite you to put your hand over your heart in namaste. I bow to the divine in you. We close with the words of Mr. Rogers. I believe that appreciation is a holy thing, that when we look for what's best in a person we happen to be with at the moment, we are doing what God does all the time. So in loving and appreciating our neighbor, we are participating in something sacred. Let's keep this faith, beloveds, and pass it on. The service begins when the service ends. Bless your hearts. Amen. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.